Thank you for coming to join us here today. My name is Erin Griffith and I am here at the Silver City Museum where I am the educator at the museum. Um, we are very, very, very happy to be able to present to you today Professor Andy Hernandez. He is a professor of history at Western New Mexico University and uh, he's going to be speaking on border wars and some information on bandits, banditry and all sorts of interesting, fascinating, and um, frankly, at times disturbing information um, from our, our past in this state. And it's great to have him here with us today. Before uh, we start into that, I just wanna do a little house cleaning um, and let everybody know that I will be moderating the chat box here in a little bit, and I'll be posting information such as how you can donate, something that we desperately need. Um, just like everybody else here at the museum, we're having budgetary problems and all of our programs that we offer and all of our events are free. Um, so anything that you can give, we encourage a $5 donation, but if you can give more, excellent. If you can't, if you can't give anything at all, the best thing that you can give us is just being here today. And we really appreciate your presence and supporting us and keeping this museum open and going. Um, also, I want to let everybody know that uh, there are openings for the Silver City Museum Society. Um, that's a, a wonderful group of people that help support us. And, but I don't want to take away too much for what we're here for. And so um, without further ado, Professor Andy Hernandez. Thank you, Erin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your Saturday morning for this. Uh, the talk that I'm going to offer today is an expanded version of a presentation that I had intended to make at this year's annual conference for the New Mexico Historical Society. Uh, that course, like every other academic conference and like so many other gatherings, has been canceled uh, for this year. Uh, so I'm happy to be able to still uh, share this uh, research in a broader forum. Uh, and hopefully in better days, I'll be able to do it again at another academic conference. Uh, this is a very big topic. Uh, it was going to be a challenge to fit it into the 20 minutes of a, an academic conference presentation. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy or get something out of the next 40, 45 minutes. Uh, this is the kind of topic that could easily be telescoped out to uh, a couple of hours uh, if everybody could stay awake for that long. So I will share my slides. And we will be talking about uh, border wars, intrigues, and bandit raids. Uh, it was a bit tough to set the time period here. I'll primarily be looking at 1915 to 1917, but I'll dabble a little bit outside of that as well. Uh, and these slides uh, will be made public by the museum. Uh, most of the material on these slides, excuse me, uh, will be made public by the, for the, uh, by the museum uh, within the next week. So you've got my contact information on here as well. Now, uh, as this kind of thing takes shape, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that at the end we get very rushed. So I'm gonna say thank you from the beginning instead of uh, trying to scramble through that at the end. Uh, I have a lot of folks to thank for this. Uh, I am particularly thankful to the Vice President, the Office of the Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Western and the Department of Social Sciences and Cultural Studies. Uh, through faculty development funds and other support, I was able to conduct a, a pretty extensive amount of research for this topic. Uh, and that research includes uh, some other folks that I'm grateful to, the staff at the Museum of South Texas History, uh, the staff at the Center for Southwest Research at UNM, uh, the New Mexico State Record Center and Archives in Santa Fe, uh, the University of Texas Special Collections and the Nettie B. Benson Latin American Collection, uh, the Texas State Archives. And I'm also particularly thankful for the Museum of Silver City for offering me this forum to share my research and my thoughts with you. Um, Aaron already made a plug for supporting the museum. Uh, folks, we all know that so many people are, these are difficult times for anybody to get through. Uh, museums are certainly scrambling as much as anybody else uh, during this period. Uh, if you are so inclined, please uh, support the Museum of Silver City uh, by becoming a member of the society or by making a contribution. 
Uh, if you're tuning in from out of area, support the museum in your own local area or another cause that's uh, still trying to make programming available uh, despite all the constraints that we're living under right now. And so, if we get started with our material for today, uh, one of the first things that I want to point out, uh, when we try to do history well, uh, there are many things that we try to do, uh, but one of them is that we try to understand the events within the context of the time uh, and with varying degrees of success to try to see the world as the people of that time saw it. Uh, now, you know, this is difficult because there's not always one, there's generally not a monolithic way that people see events at any point in time, uh, but we at least make the effort to try to understand and contextualize those many sentiments. Uh, what I was particularly taken by is that initially I was working on a piece on Texas in World War I. Uh, and the piece wasn't really what the publishers wanted, but I was still able to broaden it into an article on the uh, Plan de San Diego, which I'll be talking about quite a bit. Uh, this is uh, something I was uh, very fortunate to have studied under several academics uh, all the way through my undergraduate through graduate studies who had done research on this topic, and it's a fascinating topic. Uh, but historians, you know, especially in this day and age, we kind of get compartmentalized quite a bit. And this cartoon really made me take a step back because there's, no, there's quite a bit of scholarship on the Plan de San Diego. Uh, there is, of course, uh, extensive scholarship on the Via Raid. Uh, but the folks who were living through these events did not look at those as discrete things. These were all part of broader issues with the border. And so just prior to the 1916 presidential election, uh, we have a political cartoon here where Lady Liberty, as she was depicted in that day, uh, is looking out over two things. The first is cemetery, uh, and the second, she's looking out across the international boundary. Uh, if you can't see this uh, very well right now, that's okay. Uh, like I said, uh, the museum will make uh, the majority of this material available to all of you. There's actually only one slide that I can't make available, and I'll point that out later. Uh, but what I want to point to is that Lady Liberty is looking at the memory of the U.S. citizens who were murdered in the Via raid. Uh, and she's also looking at other victims of Via over here. Uh, but here she's looking at victims of Mexican bandits. And over here, uh, euphemistically, victims of the Mexican outrage. Uh, and over here, victims of a Mexican raid. And then in the background, we have Columbus. Uh, we have a misplaced saguaro cactus that you won't see in Columbus. Uh, you have Mexico and events such as the Battle of Carizal, one of the major losses of uh, Pershing's expedition. So uh, we're going to try to look more broadly at the entire border, even though I'm going to emphasize the Texas boundary. We're going to look a bit at uh, New Mexico as well, because these events are integrated. Uh, and we're also actually going to look even further. We'll take a brief look at Arizona and California as well. Uh, this was a period of many euphemisms. Uh, these are various medals for what was referred to at the time as the Mexican service. And so if you are a member of the U.S. Armed Forces who was generally deployed to some aspect of what was referred to as the Mexican service between 1911 and 1917, uh, in general, this is the uh, medal that you were awarded for service. Uh, on the left, we have the army that was awarded to soldiers. Uh, on the right, we have, uh, excuse me, next to that, we have the medal that was awarded to sailors and marines. Uh, and you might wonder how they might have been involved, but keep in mind that the US, for example, did occupy uh, the port city of Veracruz in 1914. So uh, that was certainly uh, one of the uh, broader incidents that was involved. But then there was a whole category of other service on the border. Uh, and this was the medal who, that was awarded to uh, soldiers and National Guardsmen who were mobilized to Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and California from uh, 1915 to 1917. Uh, of course, members of the Pershing Expedition also got this particular medal. So a little bit of background for you. Uh, there are two things that I want to look at in particular. Uh, the first is the Texas, uh, the boundary between Texas and Mexico. Uh, and this was a period of enormous flux. Uh, because South Texas had largely been isolated from the rest of the state and, in fact, from the rest of the United States uh, in the preceding decades. But all of that began to change in 1907 when the uh, first railroads were finally fully connected to border cities like Brownsville and to uh, Del Rio and other uh, communities in the area, Laredo, of course. 
Um, it was a time then, as a result, that there was a large influx of people moving into the area from other parts of Texas and the United States. Uh, and so I have this great quote here uh, by one of the observers of the time reflecting back on this era, uh, basically describing this as a speculative land rush, uh, where there was quite a bit of lucrative land, especially for ranching and uh, uh, for cattle and for horses. And so uh, there was quite a bit of a land rush, which naturally created a tension between the existing owners of uh, Mexican descent uh, and the newcomers to the region from other parts of Texas and the United States. Now, South Texas had also, prior to this point, by and large escaped uh, some of the other uh, policies such as Jim Crow that had been taking shape in other parts of the United States since the Civil War. Uh, as more people immigrated into the area, that began to change as well. And one of the most uh, notable events came in November 1910, when a Mexican uh, migrant named Antonio Rodriguez uh, was arrested and accused of murdering uh, an Anglo-American woman on her ranch near Rock Springs, Texas. Uh, Rodriguez did not actually survive to go to trial uh, before uh, that was even a possibility within just a few days of his arrest. Uh, he was kidnapped from a mob, by a mob from his prison, and burned at the stake. Uh, so we have a particularly horrific way to die and a particularly horrific form of uh, lynching that was increasingly common in parts of the United States. Uh, the U.S. inquiry never really got off the ground, uh, but this did make international headlines. Uh, and the Mexican government began its own inquiry. Um, it was organized very well initially, but it wasn't able to get very far because by the end of November 1910, the Mexican Revolution was already also fully underway, uh, and uh, any Mexican investigation was uh, necessarily distracted. Uh, but as the Hispanics of South Texas would describe the policy, uh, this to them was the emergence of Jaime Crow, their variation of uh, the observation of the Jim Crow practices and laws uh, that, and policies that had taken shape in other parts of the United States. Now, as the Mexican Revolution continued, uh, the border areas of the United States were especially attractive for a few reasons. Uh, one that I'll talk a bit more about uh, later on is that uh, the border towns were very popular uh, for logistics for different revolutionary factions, uh, for buying weapons and ammunition and other supplies. Uh, but there was also the illegal activity. There was an appreciable increase in cattle wrestling and horse thievery along the uh, international boundary. Uh, and local residents described it as a reign of terror, but it was one that was primarily confined to theft of property until 1914. Uh, and early in that year, a Mexican rancher named Clemente Vergara uh, had 11 of his horses stolen while they had been grazing on a disputed island in the Rio Grande in South Texas. And so uh, Vergara crossed into Mexico to attempt to speak with the army garrison commander uh, in his, excuse me, in his area about the theft of these horses, and subsequently he was beaten to death. Uh, we're not quite sure if this was at the behest of the army, which was unlikely, uh, or more likely that the horse thieves were uh, just not really excited about him trying to push an investigation of their theft. Now, Governor Oscar Colquitt uh, was in the, uh, entering into the final months of his term as governor, and he considered sending the Texas Rangers to recover that Vergara's body, uh, which would have caused an international, international incident because uh, the various U.S. administration asked that the international boundary not be violated by Americans. Uh, Colquitt would have been willing to do that and actually gained quite a bit of prestige nationally uh, for his willingness to do so. But ultimately, the Rangers were able to secure Vergara's body without crossing the border. So, with the potential for border violence beginning to increase, uh, Colquitt authorizes a rank, an increase in the ranks of the Texas Rangers, uh, from something in the neighborhood of the low 40s up to 75. Uh, and his successor would double that amount as violence increased over time. Uh, one thing that's important to note here that is that when you do a rapid recruiting, uh, it's extremely difficult to always attract the highest quality candidates. Uh, and if you take a look at Colquitt's papers at the time, uh, Colquitt uh, received numerous letters from uh, young adventurous men in Texas who cited their ability to ride a horse and their marksmanship uh, and their ability to, uh, you know, live under fairly rough conditions 
uh, as reasons that they should be recruited to join the ranks of the Texas Rangers. Um, this was not a time necessarily when there was an extensive amount of law enforcement training uh, or formalized professionalism uh, that went into uh, what you would normally do with new recruits. Uh, now the other major piece uh, that we need to take a look at is the broader Mexican Revolution itself. Uh, and this is particularly notable for many reasons, uh, but one of the most important is that uh, this was an extremely violent event and US policy had been hopelessly contradictory. Uh, theoretically, the United States would have been neutral, but in reality, the United States could influence events. And the primary way that US policymakers did so uh, was by the degree to which uh, various combatants, as I mentioned earlier, uh, could buy weapons and ammunitions, uh, weapons and ammunition, excuse me, uh, in border towns, or in some cases, uh, via notably, but others as well, uh, were able to legally establish direct ties with US weapons manufacturers to buy weapons in, uh, in larger quantities. Uh, now, there were also some notable cases too, where selectively uh, revolutionaries could use US territory to plan and organize. Uh, and this was actually the case for Francisco Madero, who led the overthrow of the uh, dictator Porfirio Diaz, who entered exile in May 1911. Uh, there was a period briefly earlier than this when the revolution was beginning, uh, Madero was able to escape confinement and he crossed into the United States. Uh, and he set up shop in San Antonio uh, with the awareness of US officials and used uh, his hotel in San Antonio to raise money, to organize his revolutionary army, uh, to work out the logistics and then cross back into Mexico and to lead the revolution. So, you know, the US, tried to say it wasn't taking sides, but it was taking sides. Uh, and it wasn't doing so consistently because just a few years later, uh, US Ambassador Henry Lane Wilson, under the Taft administration, actually encouraged uh, the seizure of state by Victoriano Huerta, uh, a general who had served under Porfirio Diaz. Uh, this seizure of state, Madero and his brother and several of his closest advisors were arrested. Uh, they were shot uh, while attempting to escape. Uh, and this was in the closing months of the Taft administration. So policy shifted once again, just a few months later, because Woodrow Wilson uh, was ideologically, uh, saw himself as a champion of democracy uh, and was personally offended by what he saw as Huerta's anti-democratic actions. And so even though Huerta came to power with the blessing and active encouragement and support of the US ambassador, Woodrow Wilson saw Huerta as anti-democratic and intervened, uh, specifically by occupying the port of Veracruz, uh, in part to stop German weapon shipments uh, from uh, getting to Huerta so that he could continue to fight uh, against the surviving generals who were still fighting on behalf of Madero. So Huerta was forced into exile as a result of Woodrow Wilson's actions. Uh, but even so, there were several uh, potential leaders emerging and Wilson and his administration were fairly indecisive moving back and forth, primarily in their support for Pancho Villa uh, and also in their support for Venustiano Carranza. So we have a photo of uh, Carranza here. Uh, we have one of his official portraits. Uh, we also have a photo of Villa, August 1914 uh, at Fort Bliss in El Paso. Uh, a couple of things I'll point out here. Uh, we have Villa at the center of the photo here. Uh, on the right, we have General Alvaro Obregón, uh, probably the most competent general, arguably, uh, to be produced by the Mexican Revolution uh, and a very close ally of Carranza's. Uh, within a few months of this photo, uh, Villa and Obregón were trying to kill each other. Uh, over here on the left, uh, we have General Pershing, a uh, big smile on his face, uh, probably not smiling as much, uh, the better part of two years and change later when he was crossing into Mexico with the punitive expedition in the hopes of capturing Villa uh, in response to Villa's raid into Columbus. Uh, one other photo I'll just point out here for uh, out of interest, uh, you have a young Patton as a lieutenant in the army who would also be joining the Pershing expedition subsequently. So Huerta goes into exile in July 1914 uh, Villa, Zabata, and Carranza, uh, Obregón, remain as the most viable contenders to lead Mexico. Uh, as the factions begin to coalesce against each other, 
Carranza and Obregón are allied against Villa and Zapata. Uh, Wilson, uh, President Wilson in early 1915 uh, is talking about the uh, ongoing revolution in Mexico uh, and says, uh, apparently ignoring his previous actions in Veracruz uh, and uh, conceivably ignoring the future actions he was planning to take, uh, told the US press, it is none of my business and it is none of your business how long the Mexican people take in determining their government. It is none of my business and it is none of your business how they go about the business. So Villa uh, waxed and waned between supporting Villa and supporting Carranza. Uh, and to some degree, uh, the matter was outside of his hands because as 1915 progressed, Obregón won a series of major victories against Villa's forces, uh, with the most prominent battles being those at uh, Celaya and León. Uh, Obregón actually lost his arm in one of these uh, at León and uh, nearly lost his life as a result of his wounds. So with Villa rapidly declining in his prominence and in his ability to wage war, Wilson began to hope that Villa would concede defeat. Uh, now Wilson's own cabinet was of two minds here. Uh, because some of his officials proposed that uh, the U.S. government should actually buy via, uh, beef from some of the stockyards as a way of helping to fund his continued fighting in the revolution. Uh, and Wilson quickly squashed that. Uh, but you get a sense for how the administration was of two minds about who they should support. Now, it's in this context that Carranza is emerging uh, at the head of the faction that is militarily dominant and is hoping that he can force recognition from Wilson and cement his place as Mexico's leader. Now, part of the reason that uh, Carranza was certainly uh, so willing to take matters into his own hands, uh, it, it's a testament to the degree to which the Wilson administration uh, was trying to influence events, but was trying to do so haphazardly, uh, that Wilson actually proposed a compromise candidate. He proposed that both uh, Carranza and Villa and their uh, allies, Obregón and um, Zapata, announced that they would not pursue leadership of Mexico and instead that they would accept a compromise candidate. Uh, the particular uh, compromise candidate that Wilson had in mind uh, was a descendant of the first emperor of Mexico, Agustin de Iturbide, who at this time was the chief of police in Mexico City. Uh, and I guess the one thing that unified all of the various factions is they uh, did not want the son of a of an emperor from the previous century taking over. So uh, they wanted to try to move to force the US hand instead of waiting for the administration, uh, the Wilson administration, to develop a cohesive policy. And it's, this, it's in this context that the Plan de San Diego became very prominent in US-Mexican relations. Uh, this was a document that was created in January 1915 uh, by former supporters of uh, General Victoriano Huerta who at the time were still hoping that he might come back to power. Uh, this was an irredentist plot, and it called for a general revolt in the US Southwest. Uh, the revolt was timed to begin on February 20th, 1915, and it called for the creation of a series of uh, multi-ethnic states along the US-Mexican border uh, within the boundaries of Colorado, uh, California, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, there were various iterations of the plan. At various points, it was expanded to include uh, Oklahoma and even Mississippi uh, to create uh, new states for Apaches and for African Americans as well. Uh, and the manifesto even pointed, various versions of the manifesto even pointedly indicated that they would happily accept uh, the ranks, uh, the uh, members of the uh, Japanese uh, immigrant community in Mexico into their ranks as well. Now, this was initially a plot by Huerta supporters, and Carranza uh, dis, uh, informed U.S. officials of the plan and of its intent. Uh, probably the most striking piece that most definitely um, made this a high-stakes uh, pr uh, proposition is that the original plan also called for the execution of all Anglo-American males over the age of 16. Uh, and so essentially, uh, this called for the beginning before uh, a race war within the United States, a war of no quarter. Now, initially, as terrifying as that would be, the plan wasn't taken seriously. Uh, Basilio Ramos, who was the first Mexican national uh, who was arrested and uh, captured with a copy of the plan in his possession, 
uh, was in jail for a few months in Brownsville and was ultimately released in May of 1915 because even though the plan called for uh, violence uh, across the border and even though it called for the, uh, all of this raiding, uh, nothing had happened. And essentially Ramos was treated as if he was crazy. Uh, the judge remarked that he must have mental health officials, uh, mental health issues and that he needed to get help. So this might have started out as potentially terrifying but harmless, but ultimately it evolved in Carranza's hands because he needed the means to exert pressure on the United States. And so what he would do is he encouraged uh, bandit raiders uh, to either organize within the United States or to cross from Mexico into the United States, specifically into South Texas. Uh, to raid outlying ranches, destroy telegraph pole, telephone poles and rail lines, uh, and to uh, carry out other uh, activities to sow chaos, uh, this all in the summer of 1915. Now, even though earlier versions of the plan called for a race, uh, a race war without quarter, uh, initially the raids and violence in South Texas targeted Mexican-American ranchers and farm workers just as often as they targeted Anglo-Americans. Now, Carranza committed relatively few force of his, forces of his own, but there were distinct times uh, that U.S. Army officers noted that Mexican garrisons along the border would provide covering fire uh, when bandits, the city Ciosos, uh, were outgunned and they needed to retreat into Mexico. Uh, there were occasions when small numbers of Mexican regulars accompanied city Ciosos on raids uh, and in which uh, Mexican mil military personnel and some officers in particular were captured. Uh, in the course of bandit raiding. Uh, and there were certainly numerous occasions where uh, bandit raiders were using uh, the same types of weapons that the Mexican army itself used. Now, the principal Sedicioso leaders in the summer of 1915 were Luis de la Rosa and Aniceto Pisania. Now, keep in mind here, uh, when I was talking about the background, I was talking about some of the tensions, particularly over land ownership in the first decades of the 20th century. Uh, Pisania uh, was emblematic of the personal conflict that was at work here as well, because he owned the Los Tulitos Ranch in South Texas, and he had been resisting various uh, schemes by his neighbors to acquire his property over the previous years. Uh, now in the course of all of, of the fighting that was to ensue, the highest costs were paid by Hispanics in South Texas, uh, because as conflict took shape, uh, faced with an increasing number of raids and faced with fears of a racial war without quarter, uh, the Texas Rangers and local law enforcement routinely engaged in extrajudicial killings of Tejanos with no regard for whether or not they were guilty or even sympathetic uh, to the Sediciosos. So a few other folks to identify here uh, as we continue on. Uh, one of the most notable is Major General Frederick Funston. Uh, and we have a photo of him on the left from earlier in his career. Uh, Funston had applied to West Point, but had been rejected. Uh, he had served as a volunteer in the Spanish-American War. Uh, he became a household name in the Philippine-American War because it was his, the execution of a strategy that he devised uh, that led to the capture of uh, the Philippines' most uh, capable insurgent general, uh, Emilio Aguinaldo. Uh, Funston had the dubious distinction of being the commander of the Presidio in San Francisco uh, during the uh, Great Fire and Earthquake early in the 20th century and was uh, roasted by notables such as Mark Twain for the degree to which he tried to use the army to uh, restore order, uh, shoot looters and that sort of thing uh, with uh, a number of innocent San Franciscans unfortunately being killed while the army was trying to restore order. Uh, he was also the military governor of Veracruz during the U.S. occupation, and uh, subsequently he was entrusted with uh, U.S. Southern Command. So he was the commanding general of U.S. forces that were deployed along the border from the period 1915 to 1917. Uh, Funston was a larger-than-life figure who was a, house, who was a household name uh, due to this resume that he had, uh, of service that he had offered to the United States. If he had not died of a massive heart attack, in the San Anthony Hotel in San Antonio in February 1917, Wilson would have placed him in command of the American Expeditionary Forces to Europe in World War I. Uh, and in fact, when a young Douglas MacArthur delivered the news of uh, Funston's death to Wilson, uh, Wilson looked around his advisors and openly asked who he was going to put in charge of the Expeditionary Forces. 
Uh, one other notable figure here, uh, Governor James E. Ferguson of Texas. Uh, Ferguson was governor during the period of raiding tied to the Plan de San Diego. Uh, he increased the Texas Rangers from the 75 authorized by Qualquit to uh, closer to 150. Uh, Ferguson was a bit of a shady character in Texas. We'll see part of this as we go on. But uh, keep in mind that Ferguson was actually impeached uh, later in the decade. Now, he was not impeached for his actions tied to the Plan de San Diego. Uh, he was impeached for attempting to meddle with the governance of the University of Texas. And for the Texas legislature, that was a step too far. Uh, now, I raise this here, uh, not necessarily uh, for any other point, but to point out in particular that it makes it sometimes difficult to study Ferguson because in order to avoid a broadening of his impeachment inquiry, Ferguson burned quite a few of the papers, uh, official and personal, that had uh, been part of his administration in order to keep the legislature from gathering additional evidence. So uh, it's, very, it's a bit difficult to uh, do research on Ferguson, and also incidentally, uh, because he was impeached for attempting to meddle in the University of Texas, most of the papers of the governors of Texas are actually housed at the University of Texas. Uh, you have to go to the Texas State Archives to get to most of Ferguson's papers. Uh, there's still a bit of underlying animosity there. But so we have a situation where Funston is in charge of Southern Command and where he moves thousands of US troops to South Texas to discourage city CSO raids. Now, as the scope of violence increases, uh, what might have seemed like a reign of terror when uh, there was cattle wrestling and horse thieving, uh, becomes quite a bit more terrifying when bandits are raiding and uh, killing the occasional person that they get, killing the occasional Texan or a soldier, when they are cutting telephone lines, when they are attacking ranches, when they are destroying railroad bridges and derailing trains and all of these things. Uh, Ferguson primarily wants order restored quickly. And to do this, he offers a preemptive pardon to the leadership of the Texas Rangers. Uh, he tells them that uh, the Rangers will be pardoned for any actions that they take as they see fit. Now, Funston, for his part, uh, perhaps shaped to some degree by his experience at the Presidio, but also most certainly shaped by the fact that he had an quite a bit of experience in fighting insurgencies in the Philippines, uh, Funston demonstrates uh, remarkable restraint. Uh, U.S. forces are not to fire unless fired upon. Uh, they are to distinguish between American citizens and raiders, uh, especially in abiding by uh, the provisions of uh, uh, passe comitatus and, and related statutes. Uh, Funston was also quite adept at deploying U.S. troops in small units in order to defend potential targets. So keep in mind that when we take a look at the violence that takes shape, to some degree it's significantly mitigated by Funston's actions. Uh, one other thing to note is that the rangers uh, were generally not present at battles with city CSOs, and this will be important for a photo I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, but usually the rangers arrived after the fact. Uh, based on newspaper accounts and on hearings conducted after this conflict, though, it was quite clearly documented that, there, that rangers were responsible for numerous summary executions. Uh, there were, however, no rangers actually tried uh, and certainly not convicted for any of that violence. To put things in context, from the summer of 1915 to the 19, summer of 1916, there were a total of 21 U.S. civilian and military deaths in South Texas. Uh, Funston, for his part, estimated that at least 300 Mexicans or Mexican-Americans had been summarily executed. Uh, the number was almost certainly higher because for decades to come, uh, families routinely found human remains in isolated areas of South Texas, uh, primarily skulls with bullet holes in the skulls. Uh, there were hearings conducted in 1919. Those hearings placed the figure as high as several thousand. Uh, so there's quite a bit of ambiguity in the number of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans uh, who were killed or were executed. Now keep in mind that this is not an issue of the fog of war, uh, where it's difficult to, uh, where, where there's so much uncertainty, but it is a large degree, to a large degree for Ferguson a matter of intent. Uh, in one particular uh, raid, uh, the Norius Raid. Norius was the largest branch of the King Ranch, a uh, ranch of quite a reputation in South Texas. Uh, Norius was the southernmost branch, and uh, D.P. Gay happened to be at that ranch in late August 1915. Uh, he was an official in the U.S. Immigration Service. 
Uh, he happened to be on that ranch, at that ranch, on the day of the largest uh, pitched battle tied to the violence and raiding of the Plan de San Diego. Uh, Gay was there with a detachment of eight soldiers uh, and joined several workers in defending the King Ranch against these estimated 80, ranger, 80 raiders. Uh, essentially, the only way that they were able to survive this is that they discovered after the fact that one of the first raiders that they were able to kill uh, was actually the leader of the raiding expedition. And so uh, the command and the control of the raiding broke down. Uh, there was a pitched fight, but the raiders became disorganized and ultimately, ultimately they withdrew. Now, uh, Gay shows that it's possible to make distinctions because he notes that even though this was a time that Texas officials themselves were beginning to impute a broader sense of collective guilt upon Hispanics in South Texas, uh, he speaks specifically of one particular cowboy, Lauro Cavazas, who joined the Raiders, the Defenders, excuse me, not the Raiders. Uh, and Gay said, I quote, uh, quote, that I hope that I have not left the impression that I am prejudiced against the Mexican people. They as well as we have their good and bad. Some people have the idea that Mexicans are treacherous. I have not found them as a class to be, although on the other hand, they are grateful and full of gratitude and they are not cowards. Uh, now, what did irritate Gay uh, he reserved special contempt because so many people claimed in subsequent years that they had fought at Norius. Uh, it was something that everybody tried to say that they were there and took part of uh, and were there to give the bandits what for. Uh, since you could count the defenders uh, with both hands and uh, with all your fingers and toes, though, uh, Gay knew who was there and who wasn't. And he would speak publicly against anybody who said they would. And uh, this would range everything for, to everything from a denunciation to uh, you know, picking fights on trains or in other public venues when people claimed that they were there and had not been. Now, one of the groups that Gay was talking about in particular, uh, we have a photo here from the day after the raid. Uh, and this is a photo of three rangers on horseback. And they have lassoed the bodies of sediciosos uh, and then made a very public display about taking them back to town afterwards. Uh, this was quite a bit uh, there's quite a bit of intent in shaping this public perception, especially because the rangers had been out on patrol uh, and had not actually taken part of the defense of the ranch. Uh, but they wanted to create the image that they had, uh, and they wanted to create the image that they had uh, lassoed these bandits and were dragging their bodies back for public display. Uh, now, one other, another thing about violence, uh, you know, we, people respond in strange ways to crises. And so I mentioned earlier that there, was, uh, there were raids, there were people killed uh, in the course of these raids against different ranch ranches and other targets. Um, sometimes people respond strangely though. Uh, and in October, 1915, uh, here we have a train wreck, the proverbial train wreck, right? Uh, here we have a train wrecked at uh, Olmito outside of Brownsville. Uh, basically, uh, a, br a bridge over a ravine in the area had been blown out, uh, and some of the tracks had been destroyed as well. So here you have the uh, train overturned, uh, you have all the wreckage and the chaos, uh, but you also have a family out here to take a photo. Um, I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Uh, this really isn't that inconceivable uh, by our standards today either. So we have this violence that's ongoing. Uh, Carranza was a master at creating perception and at maneuvering Wilson because Carranza could selectively order, because he was controlling it, order increases and decreases in raids. Uh, he could make a show of punishing army officers who uh, might have been in charge of garrisons who provided support for the bandits and that sort of thing. Uh, and this all uh, really resonated with Wilson. So by late October 1915, uh, Wilson signaled that by the end of the year, he would grant de facto recognition to Carranza's government. What this meant as a matter of practical application is that Carranza was able to eliminate Villa as an opponent, uh, by and large, because first, the US ended arms sales to Villa's forces. And second, the constitutionalist forces under Carranza were actually able to take advantage of active support from the United States to, to further uh, eliminate Villa's base of support. Specifically, and this might seem unimaginable, but the Mexican elements of the Mexican army were authorized to cross into Eagle Pass, Texas, 
to take the train from Eagle Pass to Arizona, to cross into Sonora and to reinforce Carranza's uh, deployments at Agua Prieta. Uh, this was the area that was the final large concentration of troops available to Villa. And because Carranza was able to reinforce uh, his units holding out there, uh, Villa suffered his final catastrophic loss uh, and was no longer a viable contender for national power in Mexico. Um, Carranza had what he wanted, but Villa was precisely the wrong person to treat like this. Uh, the raid on Columbus was then Villa's opportunity to retaliate against the United States while simultaneously moving to weaken Carranza. Excuse me, I went backwards instead of forwards there. Uh, so then we have a photo of Columbus uh, in the aftermath of Villa's raid in March uh, 1916. This was a photo on the taken near the centennial. Uh, this was a photo taken, excuse me, and shared near the centennial by the Deming headlight. Uh, so, of course, uh, Pershing's raid, excuse me, Villa's raid into Columbus was something that Pershing, that uh, Wilson did not ignore. Uh, the Pershing expedition was organized in order to uh, punish Villa, the punitive expedition. It's, it's right there in the name. Uh, the difficulty, though, for Pershing is that his orders were somewhat ambiguous, and also he had to contend with chasing the east of forces, and also with opposition from elements of Carranza's constitutionalist army. Now, simultaneously, uh, in looking at the border as a cohesive whole, and instead of looking at the individual elements, uh, Carranza saw the opportunity to put pressure on the U.S. because every moment that Pershing was in Mexico uh, was a, a problematic for Carranza. Uh, Mexicans were increasingly, increasingly uh, the, the Pershing expedition uh, stoked quite a bit of nationalistic resistance and led to the perception of Carranza as weakening the longer that the expedition was in uh, Mexico. And so Carranza simultaneously orders renewed raiding in Texas tied to the Plan de San Diego. Uh, the, reds, the raids in Texas this time though uh, were not confined to soft targets like uh, ranches and isolated outposts. Uh, and telephone poles and train tracks, uh, there were overt clashes between U.S. and Mexican forces, uh, with, uh, particularly with Mexican regulars taken as prisoners as a result of some of these raids, taking both uh, nations to the very brink of warfare. Uh, this was not an easy uh, path for the United States as well either because the Pershing expedition su suffered some significant defeats. Uh, one of the most significant at the Battle of Carizal, uh, June 21st, 1916, American soldier, uh, 11 American soldiers were killed and 24 were taken prisoner. Uh, it's also during this period that we have some nice artifacts to show us how uh, the city CIOs received their orders for what targets to pursue and that sort of thing. Uh, because here we have one particular telegram uh, that was sent uh, between various officials and clearly it's encoded. Um, I have not deciphered it by the way. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, nobody has either. Uh, but we do have, uh, excellent among them, some of the uh, artifacts that show us how Sedicioso's in the field would decipher these telegrams. Uh, because you essentially you have here what uh, an archivist at the Museum of South Texas described as something that we might have expected from a cereal box in the 1970s or 1980s, uh, if, for those of you who are that old. Uh, but essentially you have a series of concentric wheels uh, that you align and then uh, you get, uh, you're able to decipher the telegram. Basically the number, you align the numbers according to the code within the telegram uh, and then you convert those to letters and then you get your, and, uh, you get your message. Uh, sounds easy, uh, maybe one of you would, would want to take a crack at it. Now as the violence continues, uh, as the U.S. and Mexico are pushed to the brink of, the, brink of open, uh, brink of formal warfare, American officials, Mexican officials, state officials in Texas, state officials in New Mexico, the local press had all been describing this as an undeclared war. Uh, but essentially the one thing that neither side could afford, could afford was the one catastrophic event that led to an open declaration of war. Uh, Mexico's army at this point was exceptionally trained and combat hardened and very well organized, but they had been fighting now for six years and had taken significant casualties. 
Uh, the U.S. could not afford a war with Mexico because it was very clear at this point, even though Wilson had campaigned on not getting involved in World War I, uh, that events were beginning to uh, outstrip his control, especially as Germany resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, it's in this context that essentially Wilson and Carranza both blink at the same time. Uh, Wilson extends de jure formal legal recognition to Carranza's government. Uh, Wilson withdraws the Pershing expedition. Uh, Carranza uh, immediately withdraws all Sedicioso activity that he had supported uh, in South Texas. The cross-border violence comes to an abrupt end but violence against Hispanics in Texas reached new heights because as both sides were officially beginning to stand down, uh, Ferguson issues a new proclamation uh, where he creates a division of the Texas Rangers known as the Loyalty Rangers uh, with activities to range everything to everything from ensuring that Hispanics were sufficiently loyal, uh, which of course is a very nebulous objective, uh, to mo actually monitoring voting of polls throughout South Texas. This was not easy to find. Uh, I will note here that this is one of the many documents that uh, was destroyed in uh, Ferguson's arson, uh, but I was ultimately able to get a copy, uh, was ultimately able to find a copy, excuse me. Uh, and you can read the larger quote when these slides are posted, but the piece I want to emphasize is that in this proclamation, Ferguson says, the state of Texas demands of all persons while in her borders absolute obedience and respect to her laws and constituted authorities. Doesn't sound really unreasonable there. If Texas Mexicans will aid by word and by deeds the various peace officers in Texas to carry out this demand, they need have no fear of bodily harm and they will receive the protection of our laws. If they do not in some manner show their loyalty to this state and nation, they will bring trouble upon themselves and many crimes will be committed which cannot be prevented. Unfortunately, the prejudice of many Mexicans who might otherwise remain loyal to Texas has been aroused by bandit leaders from Mexico, and a feeling of hatred exists along our borders, which should not be. You know, on the surface, some of this doesn't necessarily sound too terribly unreasonable, but when you put it in the broader context of Ferguson's actions, of the preemptive pardons issued to the Rangers, uh, to the activities that he had supported by the Rangers, uh, it starts to become this glaring example of dubious behavior. Uh, really not all that uh, unrelated to Wilson's seemingly innocent uh, proclamation that Mexico could deal with its own internal affairs and the U.S. wouldn't interfere. Uh, so even though the violence was on the decline, uh, the lot for Hispanics in South Texas was going to get much worse. Now, we are of course familiar with subsequent events such as the Zimmerman telegram, to some degree, the Zimmerman telegram was a rehash of everything that had, of elements of the Plan de San Diego. It was this plot to give the Southwest back to Mexico if Mexico would fight to the last Mexican against the United States. Uh, and Carranza wisely saw that and did not avail himself of the opportunity. Uh, of course, with the telegram being one of the immediate causes of US involvement in World War II. Uh, I've gone much longer than I intended and I do apologize for that. I'll wrap up fairly quickly here, though, by taking a look at our remaining two states. Uh, Arizona had previously been relatively quiet, uh, but Arizona, from late 1917 to early 1918, uh, as the border was stabilized in New Mexico and Texas, uh, a German naval lieutenant named Lothar Witzke attempted to insta instigate an uprising in southern Arizona. Uh, based on his perception of racial, dis racial disparities in the United States, he thought that he could encourage the largely African-American 9th and 10th Cavalry to join a revolt against the United States and Arizona. And he thought further that the industrial workers of the world could be utilized uh, to instigate a strike and a revolt by copper miners. Um, part of the reason that this fizzled so quickly, and perhaps part of the reason that you may never have heard of this before if you have not, is that it was a remarkable intelligence, counterintelligence operation uh, U.S. and British agents ultimately uh, were able to bring this uh, plot to an end before it even began. And uh, Vitsky, incidentally, was the only enemy agent who was sentenced to death in World War I. Uh, in 1923, well after the war had concluded, his uh, term was commuted, and he actually ended up serving in the German military in World War II. Now, California 
is an interesting case all in and of itself because it is a place that, uh, whose border was remarkably peaceful during the era of the Mexican Revolution. Uh, but even though my mom always told me not to borrow trouble, uh, Californians seemed to be intent on doing so. And a lot of this was centered around suspicion of Japanese influence. Even though Japan was an ally in World War I, even though there were agreements between the US and Japanese militaries, uh, there was quite a bit of suspicion of the large numbers of Jap the relatively large numbers of Japanese nationals who were immigrating to Western Mexico, uh, principally to Baja, California. Now, this got captured in the Hearst media. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with yellow journalism, uh, but it also got captured in some of the serials of the day where the Japanese became principal villains. So one of the most remarkable was a series of uh, short stories called uh, Patria, a romance of preparedness. Uh, where this plucky uh, ranch owner sees that there's a Japanese plot to infiltrate the United States through the Mexican border, and it's all about how she uh, organizes people to resist that and to save the day. Uh, and this actually was an early motion picture produced in Hollywood as well. Uh, kind of tied to this sentiment and to some of the other suspicions, at one point, the Los Angeles Times claimed that several thousand Japanese sailors and several warships had occupied uh, parts of Baja, California. Uh, another thing, as these kinds of rumors get started, uh, a priest in San Diego claim, uh, generated quite a bit of uh, an uproar when he claimed that there were a large number of veterans of the Russo-Japanese War who had resettled at, at Ensenada uh, in Baja, California. So collectively, uh, even though the Japanese, the, excuse me, even though the California border with Mexico was relatively peaceful, uh, you can see where the intensification of anti-Japanese sentiment would have come from, uh, despite the fact that there wasn't the violence that other parts of the border saw. Now, a couple of bits about legacies. Uh, the military legacy is, you know, get, certainly gets a lot of attention, deservedly so, uh, because uh, the border wars, the bandit raids, these various insurgencies, the Pershing expedition, all of these prepared US armed forces for entry into World War I. Uh, most particularly with command and control over the National Guard, because remember, the U.S. Army is relatively small at this point. Uh, 100,000 approximately active duty soldiers. Uh, not much more than that in terms of National Guard. Uh, now, what gets a little bit less appreciation is the degree to which these conflicts also prepared the U.S. military for World War II. Uh, I already mentioned Patton. He engaged in a very noted, uh, publicized, mechanized chase in the course of the Pershing Expedition. Uh, Omar Bradley, who was not actually deployed as part of the Pershing expedition, but was posted to southeastern Arizona, uh, actually saw the potential for mechanized warfare and organized what he called a 200-mile motorized hike using, utilizing a convoy of trucks. So you can see a lot about how the uh, experiences of these two men would shape how they engaged in World War II. Now, some other far-reaching legacies. Uh, one of the biggest impacts was to draft and registration. Now, this might not seem significant. It might not seem that the American war effort hinged on South Texas, but you have to realize that the U.S. Army of 1917, this was the U.S. Army that was rapidly expanded after major waves of immigration. 20% of the U.S. Army that went to World War I was foreign born. 25% of draftees spoke little to no English. Uh, so this was a time where uh, Texans ultimately, in post-war hearings, the legislature learned that there was remarkable resistance among Hispanics in, uh, throughout Texas in registering for the draft. Uh, so the violence tied to this, especially the extrajudicial, viol extrajudicial violence of the rangers and other law enforcement agencies in South Texas, sabotaged broader American efforts. Uh, there are also the 1917 bath riots in El Paso uh, and in other parts of Texas. Uh, that were tied to fears that uh, Mexican farm workers were going to spread disease. Uh, there was the Poor Veneer Massacre, which was another example of extrajudicial judicial justice uh, against Hispanics in South Texas based on very little in the way of actual evidence. Um, I mentioned earlier that there were uh, various sediciosos who were taken prisoners, some of whom were uniformed members of the Mexican military. Uh, because there was an implied state of undeclared warfare, uh, judges in Texas ultimately uh, ruled that most of the sediciosos who had been captured needed to be released from prison uh, on the grounds that they were engaged in 
even though it was undeclared war, undeclared war, they treated it as an actual military, formal military engagement. Now, because these events didn't take place in a vacuum, uh, and, uh, within a few years of this, Governor Octaviano Solo of New Mexico uh, was one of several governors who had been uh, presented with numerous requests to pardon the various Viistas who had been taken prisoner as a result of Villa's raid, and uh, Larasolo ultimately pardoned most of these. Uh, in terms of larger racial violence, uh, the Houston riot of 1917, uh, where two African-American units believed that they were going to, that members of their unit were going to be lynched uh, in Houston, uh, led to extended violence uh, and the court-martial and execution of several members. I mentioned the loyalty rangers already. Uh, the use of the Texas Rangers as a force to monitor uh, the Hispanic population in Texas even after the violence had come to a conclusion. Uh, in 1919, there were a series of hearings uh, encompassing now about three volumes and uh, nearly 1,500 pages uh, instigated by Tomas Canales, a state representative in Texas. Uh, these hearings exposed, for example, Ferguson's preemptive pardon to the Rangers. Uh, they exposed many of the, uh, many of the uh, provided documentation for many of the instances of extradition extrajudicial violence, uh, where with very little evidence, uh, Hispanics were rounded up and uh, imprisoned or executed. Now, the victory for Canales is that the Texas Rangers went through a series of rapid reforms after hitting their lowest point uh, in this violence. The loyalty Rangers were subs subsequently disbanded. Uh, the force was shrunk extensively uh, and uh, hit the nadir of its reputation reputation, uh, it did begin to restore that reputation in the 30s, uh, beginning with Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, but the, the, the cost, though, for Canales, uh, he was threatened very publicly by Rangers and their supporters in carrying out these hearings. Uh, the net effect was that Canales uh, felt like he had escaped with his life barely, and he did not run for office again. Uh, and in fact, in Texas, there were no Hispanics elected to state office again until 1954. Uh, the last thing is that as the Rangers uh, were, as their reputation declined, uh, there were new agencies that were created simultaneously, broader in the U.S. Uh, in the early Border Patrol, uh, there were quite a few disgraced Rangers who found employment in new agencies, uh, such as the Border Patrol itself. The last thing I will conclude with uh, is actually not a broad legacy for any of you, but it's a bit of a personal one for me. Uh, because after the article that I wrote on this was published, um, I was uh, conducting some genealogical research. Uh, and Apolonio Hernandez crossed into the United States in, in uh, 1912. Uh, he was in South Texas during these events. Uh, I mentioned to all of you that there was quite a bit of difficulty in uh, registering Hispanics for the draft in Texas uh, after all of this violence and with the actions of the loyalty rangers and such. Uh, so imagine my surprise when I see uh, when I've come across Apollonio's draft card, uh, his registration for the draft in 1917. Um, not a broader legacy for any of you, but a bit personal for me, uh, because I'm not quite sure if I had lived through these events, uh, just how excited I would have been to register for the potential to be drafted into the military to go fight in Europe. Uh, and to the honor of our ancestors, uh, my forebear did. So, you know, if any of us ever had the opportunity to talk to our forebears, we'd probably have a lot of things to talk about, but I have one more to add with this, uh, if I ever get that chance. Uh, what I will leave you with now, I hope many of you are, have a voracious interest in this topic. Uh, I've put together a brief selection of things that you might want to take a look at. Uh, if you want to learn more, read these like an historian would. Uh, take any one of them and mine the bibliography. Uh, and that will take you into enough reading to be able to uh, be able to explore these topics to the extent uh, of your heart's content. Uh, I will tell you, just as an alert here, um, I didn't include many of the works on the Rangers in this period. Um, I know that this is the type of thing that uh, might have taken some of you by surprise. Uh, I will say categorically to you, uh, if you feel like I've been harsh on the Rangers, uh, you may be justified there. But I want to point out to you that if you look at any history of the Rangers written uh, between the 1930s and the present, 
Uh, even the most enthusiastic supporters of the Rangers are ashamed of this period when they're writing about it historically. Uh, this is something that they don't try to whitewash themselves. It's something they might try not to give as much attention to, uh, but it is something that they will spend a bit of a very small amount of time on, uh, admit that it was the nadir of the Rangers as uh, a credible law enforcement organization, and then talk from there about how the organization was reformed. So you've got some sources here. Uh, if any of you really want to dig into things, my email address is at the beginning of the presentation. So I'd be happy to share perhaps some primary sources you might want to look at as well. But uh, I do thank those of you who stayed on. This did go a bit longer than I intended and a bit longer than I had rehearsed. So I appreciate your patience. And uh, I know that Aaron will be moderating, so we can open the floor to questions. And I will also end the sharing of my slideshow, but we can come back to that too if we need to. Hello, I forgot to unmute myself. Hi, wow, that was really an amazing presentation. Very informative, very intense, and uh, really goes to show you things change so much and not at all. Um, so uh, I am going to open up the floor for questions and answers here in just a minute. And I'm also starting our feedback poll. Um, please take that. You should be popping up on your screens right now. Um, that this helps us uh, make things better and to keep giving you the audience what you are looking for and shows us where we can improve and lets us know all of the support and um, things like that. So appreciate it if you will take that poll. Um, also, um, also you will see on the chat box, there's some posts for um, links to donate to the society. Um, which we very much appreciate. Also visit our Facebook page, follow us, uh, like us, our YouTube channel, and get updates when new videos are shared or posted. This video was recorded and we will be editing it and posting it online for everyone to see. Um, and on that poll, 10 is good, one is bad. Just so you know. <laughs> and thank you from Georgia for that question. Um, and so if you have any questions, please type them in the QA panel. Uh, the first question that we have is from James Bronstein. And I believe he is still here. Let me find James. And... Oh, Jamie, I'm sorry. Hi, Jamie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Jamie. Um, would you like to re repeat your question for? Yeah, I wondered if the professor might say a little bit more about the nature of the border at this time. I'm under the impression that it was completely porous, that it was only um, demarcated by natural features, that there really wasn't a border patrol. So uh, could he say a little bit more about what it was like? Uh, thank you for your question, Professor. Uh, there, you, the, the border was extremely porous at this point. Uh, in fact, part of the, I, I, I very briefly alluded to the bath riots. Uh, part of the resistance to that is that these were public health measures uh, that were put into place to combat fears of a typhus epidemic that uh, this, uh, these procedures weren't actually supported by any public health official. Uh, they were there to essentially uh, assuage the fears of uh, Americans living along the border. So those were the first efforts to, like, be, to begin to formalize crossing the border uh, to, to combat a perceived public health crisis, and there was quite a bit of resistance to those. Uh, there was no border patrol in this period. It didn't come about until the 1920s. Uh, the border was relatively open, and of course, keep in mind that even when it wasn't, um, I mean, the border, we could talk so long, there's so much on how porous the border still is today. This is part of the discussion for a real or a virtual wall, right? Just how many different places 
uh, people can cross that are extremely isolated. Uh, we can magnify that by at least an order of magnitude in the early, early 20th century uh, because uh, there were limits to how far uh, anybody attempting to police the crossing of the border, even the U.S. Army, uh, could go by horseback. Uh, essentially, they could try to be proactive, but they were really uh, reactive and just trying to respond. So not much in the way of policing that we would think of today. Um, it was fairly routine for people to cross for everything from commerce to agricultural work. Uh, there wasn't a system of visas even for agricultural work at that point. Uh, now, what did happen as a result of quite a bit of all this violence, uh, we do have the first attempts to control uh, the migration of, uh, the regular migration of contract labor beginning in 1917. Uh, but that in itself was a disaster because as so many millions of men were called up to go fight in Europe, uh, the U.S. all of a sudden was starving for agricultural workers. And so that almost immediately derailed any, any of the nascent efforts to regulate the border itself. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we have another one from Sonia Cohen about it was Pancho Villa a wrestler. Um, let me get her on. Let's see. Hi, Sonia, are you there? Oh, I think. Yes, so. I am. Oh, there you are. Hi, Sonia. Will you repeat your question for Professor Hernandez? Well, I was asking whether or not Pancho Villa was a wrestler or not, because in southern Arizona, he has been considered uh, a wrestler in years past. And it seems like uh, all of the raiding is being blamed on that one gentleman, I believe it was Carrasco? Uh, Carranza. Okay. So... Uh, <laughs> So what is your status on that, on Pancho Villa and wrestling? There, there were many wrestlers, and Villa uh, most certainly was one of them. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that. Uh, for Carranza, we could say that he was more uh, interested in organizing efforts that would pressure the U.S. to support his recognition. So Carranza really wasn't about uh, organizing cattle raids or anything like that. He was about organizing... Uh, the spread of chaos in South Texas to put pressure on Wilson to recognize his government. Because basically what Carranza sold Wilson on was the idea that there was this problem and that Carranza could solve it uh, by uh, punishing the officers who got out of hand and let this happen, uh, by uh, decreasing violence and that sort of thing. And so uh, Wilson bought it. Right, yeah, it sounds like he was fixing a problem he created. Yeah, make no mistake, he absolutely was. Uh, this was, you know, one of the things that comes out of this, there, there's an unfortunate percep perception that Latin America is politically unsophisticated compared to the United States. Uh, but in the words of uh, two of the professors that I learned from, Harris and Sadler, uh, Carranza played Wilson like a fiddle. Uh, Carranza was the one who uh, was able to maneuver Wilson to do what he wanted. Uh, and this is by no means the only interest, the only event in inter-American relations where that happened, uh, but it's certainly a notable one. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, let's see. Um, I have another question here from Greg Jarrett, but before I get to that, um, Doctor, or sorry, Professor, will you um, repeat your email address for the um, for our guests? I will, and I'll actually share the slide again too. Excuse me. Okay. Let me. This is getting away from me. Hang on. Uh, first of all, I'll start us back on the readings for just a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. I've noticed that a few of you have commented that um, this was not the first that the Zimmerman telegram was not the first instance of German involvement, you're absolutely correct. Uh, please note that I alluded to uh, uh, German weapons that uh, Wilson was trying to interdict at Veracruz from getting to Huerta. Uh, if you wanna read a lot about Germany, there's Katz's Secret War in Mexico, which is still the gold standard for that. Uh, certainly not the only book on the topic, but uh, a very excellent place to start. Uh, the real difficulty for historians uh, is you know, what do you, do you have an ad hoc series of actions? 
uh, undertaken by people independently or do you have a cohesive effort by the German government to use Mexico to destabilize the United States? Uh, I've seen a lot of circumstantial evidence for the second, but not uh, any particular smoking guns, and I'm not alone on this. Um, there are enough things that, are be, that have added up over time, though, that it makes me think that possibly there was an effort, and I'm not sure how we would prove it at this point. Uh, before COVID started, uh, I had research funding to go uh, take a look at Dr. Professor Kotz's papers at the University of Chicago, and I have a colleague who is fluent in German, so we were going to be able to approach this from a couple of different directions. Um, as you can imagine, those plans are gone now. Uh, and for anybody asking for my email address, here you have it, uh, all lowercase andy.hernandez at WNMU, uh, Western New Mexico University, edu. Okay, um, uh, you And um, let's see, someone else. Ted Ingram would like to know, uh, when does your book on the topic go to press? Uh, it is a very much in the early stages, Mr. Ingram. I appreciate your question greatly. Uh, I do have an article that I shamelessly plugged on the Plan de San Diego. Uh, keep in mind that it is a small bit of waiting in a very deep pool. Uh, really what all of these things have convinced me of is that there's a need to treat the international border in its much broader context uh, as one synthetic work instead of looking individually at various incidents like the Plan de San Diego, like uh, the Vitsky affair, like the Pershing expedition and such. So maybe in a couple of years after I get rid of the projects that are at the forefront for me right now. Uh, and in fact, if uh, another shameless plug, uh, broadly constituted my areas of research are inter-American relations. So the borderlands and what we're talking about here are part of it. Uh, but the principal area that I'm trying to uh, work, I'm currently working on a book proposal, is to deal with uh, all of the plans to try to build an interoceanic canal across Nicaragua from uh, the colonial period all the way to uh, the Chinese efforts that just fell apart in recent years. But the reason I mention that here is because early in the 20th century, the U.S. intervened to overthrow the Zelaya government in Nicaragua because they believed that Zelaya was giving canal rights to Germany and Japan. And uh, just as strange as it may seem that, the, that in California, uh, a single priest in San Diego could make, everybody, could make Americans go crazy thinking that there are all of these veterans of the Russo-Japanese War setting up shop in Baja hoping to invade. Um, there's a long history of U.S. belief that Germany and Japan were going to intervene in Nicaragua for their own benefit and threaten our security with a canal. Uh, I think that I might have finally traced some of those fears back to a society party in New York City in 1910, excuse me, a little earlier, uh, a few years earlier, where a junior officer in the U.S. Navy overheard a conversation between a couple of German diplomats. And so it's kind of remarkable to see how very thin some of these uh, fears are, uh, the, the very thin basis for them, and yet they do take on a life of their own. You know, we could laugh about it, except the U.S. did overthrow the Zelaya government, and Nicaragua was destabilized for decades until we helped Samosa take power, and Samosa was extremely brutal as well. So uh, maybe that's another book as well, if anybody's interested, The Phantom of... Uh, German and Japanese influence in Latin America. All right. That's a, let's see, we have, um, in response to that, Ted Ingram is also very happy that the canal made it into the talk. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> and thank you for attending. <laughs> um, let's see, did we speak to Greg Jarrett? Wants to know um, why is there so much German influence in Mexico? Um, so I'm going to put Greg on the line. Greg, are you there? Greg? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. My, my connection's a little bit tenuous here now. Uh, first part of the seminar was great. Now I've got some audio issues. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hernandez. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very informative. Um, my general interest is anything uh, southern New Mexico, um, not particularly about the, uh, the, the uh, cross-border wars, but now you have sparked my interest. 
And you did allude to it on your last couple answers about German influence in the area in World War I and World War II. I appreciate that. It's, it's given me a little bit more clarity on it. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate your time and um, uh, it's a very excellent seminar. Uh, thank you, Greg. And even though you didn't push, first of all, thank you for attending and thank you for your comments. Um, I'll point out a few other things too. You know, uh, we take a look at how, we take a look at uh, the fact that the United States was built on immigration, uh, but there was, you know, there was still quite a bit of Japanese, German, Italian uh, immig uh, immigration from other nations into the various nations of Latin America as well. And Mexico was no exception. Uh, so there were German American communities there. There were I just keep German American. I can't believe I said that. German Mexican communities there. There were Japanese Mexican communities there. Uh, there were long-standing trade relations between the two nations. So uh, essentially, those were also factors that were at work. And for a government, for a country that had been so heavily defined by American influence and by American intervention encouraging relations with nations like Germany and Japan. Uh, this happened with Diaz, it happened with Madero, it happened with Carranza, it happened with their successors. Um, basically, that was a way to assert uh, part of a nationalistic identity for Mexico and to assert uh, a degree, however modest, of independence uh, from US interests. Correct, yes, it, it seems to make a lot more sense now. Um, I didn't realize that the the entire community, if you will, was uh, so vibrant and cosmopolitan. Appreciate your answers. Certainly. Uh, and there probably is one last incident I should refer to, to specifically. It's kind of one that stands out glaringly. Uh, there was one particular incident of raiding in South Texas where Sediciosos took prisoners and specifically asked if any of the prisoners were ger of German descent. Uh, and once they learned that two of them were, they didn't execute their prisoners. So. Uh, that's something that I'd like to explore further, especially to see uh, if this is like my cocktail party in New York City where it's very thinly sourced or if there is actually uh, some more substantial eyewitness testimony to say that the Sediciosos were that selective because that does uh, actually point to some significant German influence if that's the case. Okay. Um, Okay, we have one more question from Derek Wilmot. Is there any truth to US agents hiring Japanese agents to poison Francisco Villa? That kind of, your last answer kind of leads into this nicely. So let me put on Derek. Derek, are you there? Yes, hi, um, thank you. And I, it's a pleasure to hear you, uh, to hear your presentation there, Dr. Uh, Professor. Uh, um, I also had the, um, the honor and privilege to sit in on both Sadler and, and Harris's classes years and years ago. So, and you just mentioned them uh, here. So, uh, this actually came from one of their from their book there that I had read in their class many many <laughs> moons back. So, it'd be interesting to hear your your response about it. Thank you. They're most clearly the experts there. Um, there is a modest amount of evidence to support that. Um, it's very difficult to parse right now, and it's something that kind of leaves us hoping for more. Uh, it is, it's something where that suggestion is certainly in place, um, but, and they've pointed to some good documents to support it. I haven't built upon anything that they've done, so I'm gonna to defer to them and say that it's a distinct possibility. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Do we have any other questions? Would anyone else like to speak? Please uh, type into that QA box that you see or the chat. No one? Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Professor? Uh, no, I, 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 I'm looking at the clock now and I've seen, I see that I've talked quite a bit. So um, there's yeah. nothing else that I'll add at the moment, but um, I would be happy if any of you had any further questions to, uh, uh, to address them, to share sources, uh, any insights I might have, or, and in some cases I have plenty to learn uh, from many of you too, so I'm certainly open to that as well. Well then, um, thank you, Professor Hernandez. You did a fantastic job and that was so informative. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, before I go and say goodbye, I want to thank everybody who did our program feedback and everybody who um, 
donated if possible and for attending and giving us some great questions to push this conversation even further. And that's something that we really love to do here at the Silver City Museum is to um, try to open up the floor and, and get those conversations, sometimes those hard conversations really uh, started and um, making this a, a better place for everybody. So um, thank you for everybody. Um, also, before we go, I'd like to point out that you can like us on Facebook, visit our YouTube page. All of um, our programs are recorded and then I'll take this home and edit it and we'll put it up for you to view along with those slides at our website at www.silvercitymuseum.org. Also, uh, donate at www.silvercitymuseumsociety.org slash fundraising. Um, visit our website and tomorrow night if you have young ones you want to tune in every other week and tomorrow night is uh, one of those weeks we do a bilingual story time bedtime stories for kids that we produce from our little set here at the museum all socially distanced but you can stream that on zoom and you can access that through the website uh, the museum website along with other upcoming programs information and um, you want to join us at 7 p.m. tomorrow night for that we're having uh, stone soup soba da piedros I'm not good at that but our reader Amanda Gomez really is and so she'll be reading the story in Spanish and our director Bart Roselli will be reading in English and it should be a really good time for everybody so if you have young ones tune in for that um, you can find other upcoming events. Next month, we have uh, another talk by um, another uh, WNMU professor. Professor Stephen Fox is going to be speaking about the Jaime Crow laws in Grant County. So some of that um, might have been touched on in this lecture. And if you're interested, please join us. And I, I have a feeling it'll be almost at least almost as good as this one but we're always trying to make things better and thank you so much for joining us today uh, if you have any questions let me know you can email me at education at silvercitymuseum.org all right thank you everybody thank you everyone